Thank y'all for coming. Sorry we started a little late. I'm going to close this door. Just so. All right. If y'all got questions about it, please ask. Um, I may or may not have the answers to all your questions. All right. So, kind of informal. Kind of what we're going to talk about today, the understanding one through five, uh, just some better knowledge of it, being able to go beyond saying that's just type one or type two, actually understanding what it entails, what its materials are. Some considerations, roof ops, and apparatus positioning. Uh, we're driving these million dollar trucks, and most of the time we use them like Ubers. We don't always get that tactical position or where we need to get them parked to uh, actually use them to their full capability. Uh, we'll talk about roof traveling, uh, inspection cuts and roofs, and just con the considerations that the buildings are going to allow us to operate in. Reading buildings from the exterior is something I'm still currently learning. Um, you can get on these Prudential websites, these ha homes that are for sale, pull them up, look at the exterior, and start making educated guesses of what's behind Window number one, window number two, you cycle through them pictures, you'll probably get a better idea and answers to your questions. And the bowstring, we're going to touch on that. I've been working on that for probably close to six years now. Uh, but we'll touch base in that pretty, pretty good towards the end. This is Christopher Nam. I just like his, his quote here on the bottom, uh, out of Buildings on Fire and Fireground Leadership. If you're going to command or tactically engage at a structure fire, you better understand the building. There's a limited margin for error on today's demanding fire ground. Errors and omissions are unforgiven. The buildings that we're operating in are the host of the party. They're going to dictate what we can do in the time frame that the building's going to allow with the percentage involvement in the location of the fire. Real quick, all these pictures minus four, I have either personally took or have got from somebody who took in Greensboro. So all these buildings you are, are seeing, minus four pictures, I'll point them out, are located in our city. Uh, this was the phone shop fire, I believe it was 2014. Uh, ladder 10 was on it. But the size up, the size up starts well before the dispatch. We've all been told that multiple times. The size up is not just for that company officer. The size up is for everybody on that truck. The driver size up starts when he gets transferred and gets that map. He starts learning the block number, starts learning where commercial is versus residential, the best ways to get into these buildings and stuff like that. I like this acronym. Yes, the fire service is full of acronyms. I got this from the Auto Reading Buildings by Mettendorf and Dotson. The Stew or Stewie. It helped me remember it. Maybe it'll help y'all remember it. So this is what we want to include in our size up. The size, not just the external, not just 100 by 100, or not just uh, we got a seven story building. That internal size is really gonna dictate the layout of that building. We got high ceiling occupancies in these type two limited combustible buildings. So that's another thing we've got to be able to see before we actually get in there. Again, type one through five, there is slowly becoming a type six. Uh, it's a hybrid construction. No, it is not new. An article I read a few weeks ago was published in 1999, and they actually talk about hybrid construction in that article. So that's something we'll, we'll hit on. We'll hit on some hybrid construction. Once you get into it, you can really see that there's a lot of hybrid construction around here. Um, the use and occupancy. 
this is one of the biggest factors that I think that's going to help us determine the layout of the building is the signage. We all know if we go into a pawn shop, what do we expect when we crest that threshold of a pawn shop? Tough access. Tough access, probably not good walkways, not good layouts, and that's just in where all the people going in there to buy stuff are. Once we get behind the, the wall where they store stuff, now we're probably going to start encountering hoarders conditions like. But that occupancy can really help determine the layout of the building, what we should expect in the building, the way fire is going to travel in it. The era. Not looking for this building was built in 1991. If you can get a good educated guess and get within 10 years of that construction, it's going to help you understand the way they were using the construction methods at that time. So that's really going to help us with that size up of that building. Uh, this picture here is from the Student Center at A&T, fairly new building. I'm not going to read the definitions. The whole definitions are not up there. Uh, I'm going to hit the high spot, so feel free to read and ask questions as you see. Non-combustible or limited combustible materials. I've always was told you can't identify them from the exterior. We can, we start getting out in our territory, that's when we can start identifying these buildings pre-fire. Right? These GOVAP stuff they got us doing, it's given us an excuse to go into these buildings. So in our territory, we can determine from the exterior if it's type 1 or 2. Okay? The protected steel encasement sprayed on a membrane. If you look up above you, this drop ceiling here is an example of membrane. Is it going to be the best fire protection? Absolutely not, because it has to be put in perfectly. Every light, every speaker has to be fire caught and all that stuff. The sprayed on an encasement. The sprayed on is typically a plaster type material. If you look up here, it's that nasty looking stuff. Mono coat. I got on their website. They do a, a very large company in the sprayed on fire resistive stuff. The minimum spraymet that they sell and that they put on is four hours. Now there is a lot of variables in that spray on. After 9-11 they actually increased the thickness of the sprayed on material. So the variables with that spray on is the steel has to be treated, has to be dry before it goes on and most of this <laughs> stuff is hand sprayed like you would paint, uh, paint a car. So it's got the human error in it. And the encasement. The encasement is going to be directly below it. Now, they chose to do a sprayed on and encasement. Why? I do not know the answer to that. But this is just fire rated drywall over top of the uh, sprayed on monocoat fire resistant spray. I put this building up here because I always heard ever since I've been in the fire service that this was a wood frame building. Is there wood in this building? Yes. Does that make it a type 5 wood frame? No. Apparently at one time these apartments on either end were larger so they, they subdivided them or split them up somehow. But yes there is wood studs in that building but it is a type 1 fire resistant. To jump around a little bit just because it's a high rise in our city probably means it's going to be a type 1 res fire resistant building. Vancouver, Canada they have the first multi-story high-rise that's heavy timber. It's 18 stories. So is it possible? Absolutely. In Greensboro, we currently don't have anything like that yet, but it is becoming a thing. On all type 1 through 5, there's typically uh, subcategories. Uh, we're going to hit on some of them. We're not going to go over all of them. But you've got your center core, your center hallway, and combination. If you've ever been in Hall Towers, that's a good example of a combination center core, center hallway style building. That center core is where all your main arteries that, that feed that building are going to be in the center, and that hallway is going to branch off of. Center hallway, same thing. If it does have elevators, they're probably going to be on the ends with the stairwells, and that hallway is going to run dead center of that building. And then, like I said, combination, a good example would be Hall Towers. Compartmentalization and open floor plan. 
Yes, they contradict each other. I put that up there for me for talking points. That goes back to that signage and that occupancy on these buildings. If I go in and it's, uh, it's a telemarketing office, I'm probably going to expect a pretty decent large room on that floor. Open floor plan, maybe, but I'm probably going to have those small dividing walls in there that's going to make it a really pain in the butt for us to get in there and search especially with that search rope because of all the rooms and nooks and crannies we got to go through. The compartmentalization of these buildings, we'll use hall towers for example. All individual rooms, uh, individual apartments, excuse me. So we can use that compartmentalization to our advantage. These buildings are going to produce a large amount of heat. I don't claim to have experience fighting fire in all type 5 of these buildings. Okay, so we'll get that phone out there. I've read a lot, I've talked to people who have fought fires in these buildings in larger cities, um, and this is a lot of their information. But that large amount of heat, we're basically operating in an oven. Concrete, reinforced with steel, it's, it's basically like an oven. Once that stuff gets up to temperature, it's, it's really going to put, put us to work. The building will not contribute to the fire load. Once that building is done, the day they get their CO, everything they take in there now will contribute to the fire load. But the BTU rates are higher, the synthetic stuff higher that we're carrying into these buildings. So will the type one fire resistant building burn? You can have fires in them, absolutely. And they are typically most resistant to fire spread with that fire resistant. Picture on the right here is the new high rise. I believe it's 10 stories. I've got it wrote down, I couldn't find it. Uh, right across from the ball field, downtown. So we'll talk about this picture real quick. We walked around here with the superintendent, very knowledgeable, he was spitting out more information that I could even write down or retain. Uh, random thought, the lightweight concrete that the fire service refers to, it's 500 pounds per yard lighter than the concrete that you put on your driveway. So is that technically lightweight? That's up for your determination. But you're looking at 500 pounds different per yard. But back to this picture, I'm standing on the first floor. I'm looking all the way to the, to the roof of this building. I told him to the superintendent, what's, what's going on here? He said, this is the main artery for this building. I said, all right. I said, you going to have draft stops from floor to floor? He said, no, it's not required. <clears throat> all four sides of this will be framed out with fire resistant sheetrock. You get a fire, we'll say the fire's on two. It's near this main artery. I've got reports now of smoke on six, seven, and eight. Well, we're in a fire resistant building. How did it get there? This is what we need to think about. Stuff like this, the elevator shafts, we, we do have some pretty good interstitial space or void spaces in these buildings. Fourth entry wise, we're typically going to be operating in a metal door, metal jam, encased in concrete. Not going to get a lot of flex on these doors. My opinion, if you can't force a door and limited to low visibility by yourself, you need to practice. Because that's where we're going to be doing it on these long hallways, these center core hallways. If the hallway has already been overrun with smoke, now we've got to force what could be a very difficult door in limited low visibility. Also, hydro rams and rabbit tools, whatever you prefer to call it. The hydraulic assisted force entry. They need to go on the smells and bells and the alarms of these. The other thing to practice, the blue doors, it's got a pretty decent sized gap in it, but we can play the game. Try to get you a gap with your halligan and set that rabbit tool in there with your eyes closed. That rabbit tool is going to speed up the process of forcing all these doors tremendously. Also going to save the gas in, in, that, in our tanks, not just the air, but uh, the gas that we've got to keep going. So force entry could be a pretty difficult problem in these type of buildings. Ventilation wise, probably not going to go top side of a type <coughs> 1 fire resistant building and cut a heat hole. Not going to happen. What we can do ventilation wise in these buildings is we can start pressurizing these stairwells. There's a lot of reports and a lot of uh, civilian deaths where uh, they have found people in stairwells well after the fire was out. 
because you had the humidity was playing with the reverse stack effect and the stack effect of that smoke. Uh, we get these fans in there, start pressurizing these stairwells, try to keep them a little bit clearer for the occupants to leave and for us to make egress into there. We talked a little bit about forest entry with the access and egress. A lot of these are going to have your storm front or your glass front doors <coughs> go through and lock them, stuff like that. Our ladders, if you drive a 70 footer, you know what you can reach. If you drive a 100 footer, you know what you can reach. We don't always have the luxury of being able to put that ladder up that we're up on the floor we're operating on. Egress wise, I'm operating in a center core, a center hallway style fire resistant building. We got reports of smoke. I got a little smoke coming underneath the fire department door. We want to slow down at that point. We've got the engine company that's got to get their stuff figured out. They got to get their water supply. They got to hook up. They got to make a stretch. While they're doing that, we're just not going to stand there and wait on them to force that door and then go in. We're going to go ahead and force the two adjacent apartments from that fire apartment. That's going to be our old crap egress. We don't know if the window has failed and we're going to have a wind driven event at the time, but prior to that forcing that door. So we're going to get the two apartments adjacent opened up and that's where we get that fire apartment door opened up. That's where we can go and that buys us some time. These uh, wind driven events, fires pushing anywhere between 20 to 25 miles an hour. I can't crawl nor run on a good day at that speed. So that's what we've got to anticipate that we, we could encounter. And those drop ceilings. A lot of these floors from top of floor to top of floor of the next floor, anywhere between 12 to 16 feet. So that, with that being said, I walk in, I got a nine foot ceiling. I expect a pretty decent void space from my drop ceiling to the underside of my floor. The collapse hazards of these buildings, like I said, we're not worried about the actual building coming down on us. It's everything inside that building. That drop ceiling, all the wires, the cables, the telephone wires, the internet wires, HVAC, this is the stuff that's really going to get us tangled up. Type 2, non-combustible. I personally prefer limited combustible. Non-combustible is like a misnomer. It, it misleads me a little bit. Limited combustible, a little bit better English for me to understand. Maybe it will be for everybody else. <coughs> Floors and roofs approved in non-combustible or limited combustible materials. Typically consists of masonry and steel with a metal supported roof structure. Again, that's the fire they had, I think it was 2014. This was a fatality fire. Uh, if you notice, a little difficult to see some of these lines here. I can't remember if that's the corner that cracked or it was the Charlie Delta corner. Uh, but we'll talk about this building a little bit later. <coughs> Type 2 limited combustible comes in all shapes and sizes. It can be some of the most difficult buildings to determine because of what they can do in these buildings. This is another picture from Greensboro. I do not remember all the addresses. But get out in your territory, start making a guess, read these buildings, and then go in there. People are great to let you in. Remember we talked about the subcategories for type 1. So this is going to be the subcategories for type 2 limited combustible. You got your concrete tilt-ups <coughs> or your block walls that support an unprotected roof structure. Then you've got your steel frame enclosed by a concrete tilt up or concrete block. That one there is going to be what you see. This, all the steel is erected first, and then they come back and either block in between them or stand that concrete, whether it be pour in place or brought in on a tractor trailer. If those walls come down, that building should not go nowhere based on it's, it's fully supported by the steel, not on the walls itself. It's more like a curtain or a skin. Then you got your unprotected steel frame enclosed with metal. That's going to be your pre-engineered steel buildings. We've all seen them. We've all got them. Your garages, typically, is where you see a lot of them at. Here's an example of a concrete tilt-up. <clears throat> Dirty building. This is the um, 16th Street. Sportsplex. Thank you. You can see your lines here with the concrete tilt-ups. 
One thing, not necessarily that we're ever going to be able to determine, but there's a difference between a concrete tilt-up and a structural insulated panel. Your structural insulated panels, three inches of concrete on each side, two inches of rigid foam in between them. There has been fires in buildings like that. Not a lot, so there's not a very good percentage of information that we've learned from them. They will produce some nasty smoke. You can also have structural insulated panels in a type 5 wood frame. We typically don't have them in our city yet, based on our temperature. Um, but here's just an example of your concrete tilt-up. Those are not scuppers, those are lights. A lot of these concrete tilt-ups do not have much of a parapet, if, if one at all. You <coughs> might have one over the main entry door, maybe the alpha side, but it's typically, it's highly unlikely. You might see a roof change height, maybe where they need it depends on occupancy of the building, maybe they got a crane in there or something like that. This is your pre-engineered steel building. We've all probably been in a building like this. What's in this building that can readily burn? Insulation. Just talking about the building, not, in, not what can be in the building, but there is anywhere between 6 to 12 inches insulation on all the walls and the roof of this building. Alright? So that's just one thing we got to keep in mind. Can type 2 is burn? Absolutely. But that insulation is probably going to go up and produce some really nasty smoke. Some characteristics of limited combustible. Once again, similar to type 1, the concrete and steel don't contribute to the fuel load. But these buildings are totally different. We got protection on one, we have no protection on the other. We talked about signage and that STU or STUI acronym for the size up. This is where it's really going to take into account. If I go in that pre-engineered steel building, it's uh, auto detailing. I'm going to expect cars, I'm going to expect hazardous stuff. That signage can really help us aid in what we're going in and also the actual <laughs> layout. The biggest hazard is that fire location to the structural members. Quick little example, if I'm, if I'm <coughs> cooking chicken at the house on a offset barbecue smoker, I want the chicken to cook faster, I'm going to move it closer to the fire. I want it to slow down, I'm going to move it further away. Now that chicken, even though it's further away from the fire, is still going to be cooking. It's just going to be at a slower rate as opposed to closest to the fire. So it's still subject to the heat and smoke, maybe not direct flame and pendulum. And the void spaces. These open web bar joists are nothing more than a balloon frame structure turned on its side. All right, so I, I don't have anything to stop my vertical or horizontal <coughs> spread throughout that open web bar joist. Greensboro, a pretty good estimate of spacing is four to six feet. I think a lot of that's got to do with our weather, our snow loads, live loads and dead loads on our buildings, but four to six foot is a good example, a good go-to for our open web bar joist limited combustible buildings. Again, smoke and heat's predominantly responsible for the death of occupants. The fire spread. Granted, if fire got up here in this loft right here, this in between these two open web bar joists, will the steel and the metal burn? No, but what's on top of that corrugated metal deck, and if it's rubber <coughs> membrane or tar and gravel or roll-on or hot mop, that's where we're going to get into these roof fires. A lot of studies out there of them. Heavy smoke billowing out the top of the building, but nothing on the interior yet. You start getting stuff dropping down on you, hot tar, that's when we need to start thinking what our actual roof is made out of. Vertical ventilation in these buildings. I'm not going to say this building is safe because there's so many variables, okay? Your open web bar joist truss roofs, can they be vertically ventilated? Absolutely. Can they be operated under? Absolutely. All that being then taken into account of percentage involvement and location of the fire and the resources that we currently have on scene. All right? I don't want to preach fear tactics or tell you that you can go running in this building any day of the week and it's going to be fine. I'm not, I don't want that to be misinterpreted. But vertical ventilation, can we cut roofs in these buildings? Yes. Is it time consuming? Can be. A little bit of practice, it can be done pretty easily. We got a chance to use a chainsaw on a Q metal deck and roof. 
run that chain pretty much as tight as it'll get, it cuts it like butter. The things you got to think about, there's a lot of size up stuff on the rooftops of these. If I got a rubber membrane and I want to stay away from my seams, that's where a lot of my nails are going to be for my rigid insulation. And that's where the overlapping of my rubber membrane is. If I can stay away from them, it's going to aid in getting a, a hole faster and more efficient in that roof. You can either pull the rubber membrane back or you can cut right through it. Both saws, the chainsaw and the circular saw, will cut right through it. The downfall to these roofs, you can make a diving board real quick. And what I'm referring to a diving board is if I cut this hole right here and I stop it in between this bar joist and this bar joist. That corrugated metal decking is going to act like a diving board, all right? So that's one thing you got to be cognizant of. Feeling some of these open web bar joists with the circular saw is a lot more difficult than it is with the chainsaw. The chainsaw we've used more, more comfortable with it. We've got a little bit more dexterity with that chainsaw. The saws need to be set up to cut a roof like this. You need to tighten that chain up a lot more than you would on a wood frame roof. The picture to the right here. This was the following day of the pawn shop fire. I do not know, I was not on the fire, if they were currently operating underneath it while it looked like this. If anybody was there, you can tell me, but I do not know that. These open web bar joists typically are going to be a localized or partial collapse. It's going to lean, it's going to twist, it's going to sag. Is there reports and line of duty deaths of catastrophic collapse in a type 2 Building, yes. We can't label these as, as dangerous or safe. We have to take into account that percentage involvement and the location of the fire. All right? That's got to be a, a very large dic dictation in, in our determinant factor if we're going to go on top of it. Granted, if I got aggressive interior companies going in, got good can reports, chiefs talking to the fire attack, chiefs talking to ventilation, that's where we can really start getting some stuff done. If the inside, the top side, and the outside report don't match up, that's where we're going to fall back to that battalion chief. To he, that's going to be a decision factor for him. I got interior companies operating. I got high heat, low visibility. We get to the roof, we got nothing. So we could have a roof over. We could have multiple drop ceilings. That's where we get up there and give the can report to the chief because he don't have the luxury of see in this picture. We have to paint this picture for them. <laughs> Direction of travel on this roof. What's y'all's guess? Is it A to C? This is A here. Or B to D? What would be your guess? B to D. B to D? All right, that's a good guess. You got any anything to back it up? Why? Well, it looks like the panel or the metal is running. Okay. Yeah. That's a good indicator. The other thing is, and I got some better pictures of it with these HVAC units. He is correct. It is running from B to D. If it was running from A to C with my typical four to six foot in Greensboro on center spacing, this is either sitting on one bar joist or it's sitting in between two. So initially we get eyes on that roof. I got a large HVAC unit. My bar joists are going to travel perpendicular to the long side of that unit. Does that make sense? That way that unit's got more, it's spread out its weight over more bar joists as opposed to just being on one. And like I said, we got, I got some better pictures later on that show that what these larger units, a little bit easier to read. Prior to this fire here, when we went out there and looked at it, I never anticipated Constantine wire that I would, would be something that I would have to encounter operating on a roof. The Charlie side was pretty heavily fortified, pretty large. Uh, I believe it was one or two uh, strands of Constantine wire because there's no parapet back here. Also, the fourth entry for the Charlie side door on that one, it had a pretty heavy welded gate, uh, hockey puck lock, drop bar on the interior. So this is what we got to start thinking about when we get eyes on the roof and the walk around on these buildings. What we're going to carry with us, whether it be chainsaw, circular saw, ladder. 
Ordinary construction. Very old. Walls, floors, and roofs are entirely or partially wood. Exterior walls are going to be non-combustible materials or limited combustible materials. It's going to be your brick, block, concrete, uh, load-bearing walls. I feel sure every company in Greensboro has ordinary construction left in, in their territory. This is just a, picture, a few pictures from that building. So you're doing a walk around, maybe as a company officer, maybe you're Charlie side guy, your driver or firefighter. If you do a split, that's up to y'all. But you get back there and you run into this. I don't remember how many gas meters are on there. It's really difficult to count. But I've got a lot of apartments in this, in this building. Multiple meters here, I believe it's six on each side. I don't remember the measurement of that, but it's not very wide. All right, so alley throws, single man firefighter throws on these ground ladders. This right here is going to be your access. Almost similar to like a fire escape, but it's built into the building. Most of it was wood. All the doors that lead to the apartments over here had what's called transom windows above it. You read some of these old books, FDNY, stuff like that. They talk about transom windows. Transom windows is that window above a door. A lot of them opened. They could use get air into it. Really difficult to break in through it because it was the Jalousie style windows. But fire spread, that's going to be a weak point of these buildings are those, those transom style windows. The ladder truck on this building is out. Can't get to the trolley side due to the incline of the parking lot. The power lines on all three sides. I've got a decent sized two and a half story wood frame here beside it. So this is going to be a lot of work. This is ground ladder work. But get out, walk through these buildings. People are more than happy to let you in. If I remember right, this, both of these buildings did have some sort of basement, whether it be a full or partial basement. Uh, engine one, it's just y'all probably have seen these buildings. I don't know if you've been on calls them or not. I personally have never seen a seven story ordinary constructed building. Two to four stories in our, in our city is going to be your, a very common style building for your ordinary. It's going to be very old construction. These are going to typically have your old limestone mortar as opposed to the Portland cement. This is the stuff that you can walk up with a, with a screwdriver, pocket knife, a large master stream is going to start taking this mortar out of these brick. You can look at these brick and just tell they're old. Uh, the 40s consisted of concrete exterior walls, and then somewhere in the 40s they switched. Why did they switch? There's no building code that I have found that says why they switched. I think a lot of this switch stuff is determined by the actual contractor who is currently building but somewhere between the 40s and on to the 50s, they switched to block walls and brick masonry as opposed to concrete. Uh, it is going to have your dimensional lumber. That's a true 2x4, true, true measurement. Again, the exterior walls, concrete, or brick, they're not going to contribute to the actual fuel load of the building. Going to have your shorter spans. A good estimate of these buildings, it's going to be like your downtown Main Street style. 20 by, by 40 or 20 by 60 and 40 by 80. That's a really good size for these buildings. Typically narrower on the front just due to the location and the age they were built. And they are going to be smaller in square footage, of course, than type 1 and type 2. Go to this picture here for a moment. This is a uh, cock loft over a three-story apartment building with a full basement. Very old building, ordinary construction. True dimensional lumber. This is something we've got to anticipate or already know based on our pre-plants. I got companies inside hollering, hey, we got high heat. We cut a hole. Nothing happens. Just something that when we get to that point, it's got to be the back of our mind. All right, maybe we're operating over a cock cloth. Maybe it's a roof over. Alteration void versus design void. 
This cockloft here is a design void. It, its original intention was to be like that. Your alteration void is going to be, say they went in here, say they wanted to finish this out to apartments. Now the alteration or the renovation of this building is going to create more voids than I typically would anticipate. Those alterations and renovations are typically not going to be to the same size dimensional lumber that it was originally built with. The lumber you buy from Lowe's today is anywhere between five to eight years old. It is soft lumber, like that soft yellow pine. This lumber here can be as, as old or older than 100 years old, and it's going to be your hardwoods. They react different. That the void spaces in this building are, are endless. Dumb waiters, pipe chases, elevator shafts, stairwells, stairways, just stuff we got to think about. Picture to the right is the actual building that we're currently in. That green door right there is where we made access to this cockloft. So, do all, do all cocklofts have doors? <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know. This one does. So, that Charlie side guy or the officer doing the 360, this building's fairly large. I'd say 300 foot wide from B to D not going to be a friendly 360 building. That Charlie side guy, he can make his way through one of the apartments adjacent to the fire department. He's going to get back there pretty good. Something cool about this right here, fire escapes. We talked to this lady right here on the third floor and she gave us some pretty good information. All these apartments right here currently use this door and this fire escape as their alpha side entry. Yep. They park right down here. Everybody parks. Yep. Goes goes down to a parking lot. One of the ladies while we were there actually carried her groceries up there. It's not feasible for them to walk all the way around the building and come in the alpha side, come in their main door. So that's gonna dictate, is that gonna be something we know? Probably not. But we get to that alpha side door, we force our way into the apartment, and the layout just doesn't seem right. It's something we got to anticipate. Most people, we're all used to going in and out of our front door in our house. Well, this is going to be a little backwards. What do we think is behind these doors right here? What kind of room? Kitchen. kitchen. Absolutely, that's correct. More like a galley kitchen. Yep. Got your HVAC stuff on all there. All those windows. <coughs> Typically going to indicate a bedroom. Basement was pretty cut up, but it did go mostly <coughs> throughout this building. At the time we walked through it, there was remnants of homeless people and squatters in this basement. It's something we got to anticipate. We've got to check it. Collapse hazard to ordinary. I read an article or a book, something about unreinforced masonry, anything pre-1933. I called Katie. I said, is there any way that you can search in the database of Greensboro of unreinforced masonry? She said, no. I said, all right. I said, can we search a date? She said, yes. I said, so I gave her the date of pre-1933. Now the numbers are going to be skewed a little bit. They're not all of them are unreinforced masonry, ordinary constructed buildings. Uh, right many of them are residential homes. Remember we could only search the date. There's over 500 buildings in Greensboro that is built before 1933. Just a cool little fact. This is the Biltmore downtown. This is a good example. This is in the basement of unreinforced masonry. I got two courses of brick a long tie back course of brick and then two more courses of brick. Nothing was filled in here. No rebar, no concrete, no gravel, no nothing. These typically are going to expand all the way up to those parapets, those cornices, the facades. There's been firemen that have had career ending injuries and also line of duty deaths from operating exterior on a defensive attack that have died and severely injured from these parapet walls, the cornices, the facades, the stone corbelling, all this stuff can let loose and it's basically because of 
the old sand and limestone mortar that was used. There was no rock put in it. That's the Portland cement that we still see today. A large master stream, even an inch and three quarter, can start degrouting these walls. So we're operating the exterior position. Need to make sure we're back far enough. That collapse hazard, maybe not one and a half times, but if we're operating within parapets, need to get eyes on them. Not saying get access, make access to every roof, but we need to at least get eyes on them and give a report. Heavy timber of mill construction. Greensboro is pretty fortunate to still have some of these buildings standing. A lot of them are currently going under large renovations that is changing the complete occupancy for these buildings. Brick, block, stone, interior constructed of large wood. I did not put the whole definition of a heavy timber type 4 building up here because it would have taken two slides. <laughs> Most of it is minimum requirements. It is a very strong building, just due to the old, old growth lumber that we're going to be operating in and the actual size of it. All of us probably at one time have been into a wedding over here at Revolution Mill. Due to COVID, it was closed down. I couldn't get in it. But a lot of us have probably seen being in a heavy timber style mm -hmm. building. This one's currently been renovated. Most of it is complete. I'm not expecting a large open floor plan that still looks like a mill in there now because I got a sign that says apartments. So that signage, that occupancy really can help us out. Also getting out your territory, doing that go vap, getting that excuse to get in there, hit them checks in the boxes then spend five or ten minutes doing scenario. You ain't got to pull lines or throw ladders, but just walk through, talk about stuff. Hey, I got fire here, what are we going to do? Surface to mass ratio in these buildings. I struggled with understanding this initially. The larger the wood, the lower the surface to mass ratio. Hard to ignite, okay? I had to, like I said, I read that multiple, multiple times before I really understand it. And it really gets more in depth to actual physics than, than I can comprehend. So if I've got a big lighter and a toothpick, I'm probably going to successfully light that toothpick due to the surface to mass ratio. That same big lighter, I've got a two by four. Probably going to run out of fuel in my lighter before I get that two by four to ignite. The minimum requirement for it to be a heavy timber, like I said, the whole definition would have taken two slides. I threw this in there. The minimum requirement is a two inch thick tongue and groove. Prior to some of the tearing down of the old mill at Fairview Street, most of, <clears throat> most of the floors, the tongue and groove and the roofs of those buildings were four inches thick. And it was double tongue and groove, not just a single tongue and groove. We are going to be operating in an interior lumber yard. These are the buildings that can turn to conflagration. Cities have had them. The radiant heat coming off these buildings can be enormous. The picture to the right here, you look up, that's a, that's a sawtooth roof. They're going away. Its original purpose was this was glass on this vertical part here. The original purpose was just for light. They could open them windows, they could allow the hot air to escape during the summer because typically these things were not central heated and, and cooled. But that's that's what we're going to be, that's what just a style of roof that we can encounter in these heavy timber mill constructed buildings. So our void spaces right there are, are very little in this section of the roof. Now the five to six inches of lint and dust for the last 150 years, it's probably going to burn pretty good. But the renovations, and we'll talk about this later in the class a lot, got more, a lot more pictures of renovations. They're renovating these things completely different than this layout, which you're going to see here. This floor here, I actually found a picture in, on the Greensboro History webpage of this floor that still had all the machines in it. It was still currently being worked in. It's really cool. But we got our heavy tongue and groove here, a lot of wood.
This is the exterior of that. I added this in to uh, last class because th this way it gives you a better idea. You can see the actual windows where they covered them up on the ends here. You can see where they bricked over a lot of these windows from original. Maybe they changed the layout of their, ma their machines. This is stuff we're not, we're not always going to have the answers to. But that's the top side of this all two fruit. Collapse hazard is a heavy timber, type 4. We'll back up a little bit. Ordinary construction can also have this. This is a fire cut or a let or a fire pocket. If you go in Natty Greens downtown, you can still see where at one time maybe there was a second floor in there. You can still see where the fire cuts were. It's currently been filled in with mortar or caulk, but you can still see it. Who come up with it? I was unable to find it. The reason they changed this from a full dimensional end here, somewhere along the way they had a fire, they had a collapse of the floor. What it did, it cantilevered the wall above it out. Masonry was more expensive back when these were being built. Wood was plentiful. Somebody come up with the idea, hey, let's cut it at, at an angle. That way, if I've got a fire in the middle of my floor, my floor collapses like this, I no longer cantilever my low bearing walls above it. Like I said, these can turn into conflagrations back to the heavy timber buildings. There's been small fires with light smoke showing in these cities that have burnt blocks. It's not because they're a bad fire department. You got access issues, you got long, long stretches. You can get lost in these buildings, they're huge. But they're going to produce extreme heat. The radiant heat coming off these buildings are probably going to ignite anything close to it. They've lost trucks on these buildings that have been parked blocks away. Something you've got to anticipate. We've talked about collapse in, in all these buildings. It's all based on that percentage involvement. You can't say that this building's not going to collapse all the time based on the location and the extent of fire. But due to my service to mass ratio, my large dimensional lumber, old growth lumber, typically going to be harder to ignite and collapse is going to be lower on my, on my scale. Type 5, wood frame. Picture to the right, random fact, there's actually McDonald's on Kong. That McDonald's, before it was torn down, was the last McDonald's in the United States to have a basement under it. This one does not. Another random fact about McDonald's, the McDonald's on Summit across from a cookout was the first one in North Carolina. It's obviously since been torn down and rebuilt because it looks fairly new, but it was the first one in North Carolina. That's just some McDonald's history if you're interested in it. It's the best in town. Do what? It's the best in town. There you go. But a wood frame. That's where the rats moved to. Yeah. Ratatouille, that's right. That's right. <laughs> the rats moved across the street. Roofs are entirely or partially of wood. So was the walls. The most responsible for firefighter and civilian deaths. Why do we think that is? Lightweight. Lightweight and probably due to the total amount of them. This is going to be a popular style building. A lot of our residential homes are wood frames. So just due to the sheer volume of them, the fire potential that we have, and typically these are going to be occupied at all hours, is where I think they come up with those numbers. You got post and beam, balloon flame, platform, and one thing I didn't go put in here is stacked log or a log home. It's still considered wood frame. I tried to find some in Greensboro. There are some stacked logs or log homes in Greensboro, but a lot of people really don't care for a guy with a camera to walk up and say, hey, can I come in your house and take pictures? We've all seen one of those. But we'll go over the post and beam, the balloon frame, we'll touch on platform a little bit. If your house has been built pre-1970, even a little, little later, it's probably going to be a platform constructed house. They start with their concrete subfloor, they build a wall. Then they start their second floor. There's no, no way unless it actually burns through, there's no path of travel in that like it would be a balloon frame. 
that balloon frame will hit on some it and we'll talk about the post and beam and some of the misnomers about the fire service, how we adopt people's terminology and use it incorrectly. Uh, this is just an example of a wood frame building. We think it's old or new. Uh, 50s, 20s, what are we think? 20s remodeled. 20s remodeled. You hit the nail on the head. This was originally built in 1920. GIS has got it being redone in 1975 and it changed occupancy from residential to commercial. Just looking at this building a little bit, looks like we got a basement. The basement did go throughout in this building. This was the building I was not allowed to take pictures in because it's some kind of government intelligence, logistics type deal. Uh, but they were 100% allowing me to take pictures of the exterior. These windows right here, what do you think's behind those? Those angled windows, offset like that. Stairwell. Stairwell. Absolutely. Got a half story. Think it's balloon frame? It was, but it's probably cut up. Yeah, it could be. Like I said, I wouldn't. I don't have all the answers to this one. I've got some answers to some other stuff later in the slide. But if you'll pay close attention, I've got a door here. And we said behind window one and two here is probably a stairwell, correct? I've got another door here that looks like it was originally my main entry. I expect that door to walk into a living room eight to ten feet straight ahead. I expect what? Kitchen, maybe stairs? Yeah. If you'll pay close attention to the, to the Alpha Delta, that's another door. Why, I don't know. It looks awful odd for this door and this door to have been added in in 1975 as opposed to being there in 1920. I personally think they were all there. But this is just the stuff, the decisions that the chief officers and the captains got to make. What door are we going in? And now I've got a stair on a, a door that looks like it goes to stairs on the alpha side. Am I going to anticipate interior stairs or not? I don't know. This is stuff that we're going we're going to encounter. Post and beam. It's going to be that brace frame or pole barn style building. Got your vertical posts with your horizontal beams known as girts. So they're going to be the, the support into that structure. Can't expect rafters and ridge beams in these type of buildings. Your considerations for them is going to be your rapid fire spread due to the open floor plan. <coughs> so this post and beam, we'll touch a little bit on it. The fire service says post and beam have mortise and tenon joints. Fire service books, building construction books, says that post and beam have mortise and tenon joints. When you read actual construction books, we have adopted a terminology that is not correct. Mortise and tenon joints in the construction industry are considered a timber frame home. So that mortise and tenon joint, if I've got a six by six, I'm going to shave it down to maybe three by three and make what looks like a key that's going to go into a keyway. It's going to be square or round. Depends on the type of joinery they wanted to do. Where it's going to go into, I'm going to take that same six by six, cut that same hole, and that's where, that's my connection point. So now I've taken a decent sized dimensional lumber and cut it in half based solely on my actual structural supports and of the connection. So with that being said, post and beam in the construction industry is going to have the nice ornamental cast iron black painted steel connection points with the through bolts. If they spent the money and time to do all that, we're not expecting a lot of void spaces. They're going to leave that stuff open. It's pretty. So that's just one of the, the terms the fire service and it's not just Greensboro, it's the fire service throughout have adopted terminologies that are not always correct to the actual field of the, what they've been used in. Uh, ribbon boards, we'll hit on them more in balloon frame. 
I've got some better pictures and explanations of ribbon boards. Excuse me. A balloon frame was actually a byproduct of the post and beam. They could, they could build these balloon frames faster. They had the lumber to do it. Wood was plentiful. They could get 20, 30, 40 foot sticks of lumber. It's going to be one of your older buildings that we encounter. I can have a balloon frame single story home. <clears throat> I, I, it doesn't have to be two, three to three and a half stories to be a balloon frame. It's that continuous stud from the bottom plate to the top. I have no top plate, so when all my studs are in there, I can technically stand in there and stick my hand in that stud void and I can be, my arm can be in the attic. All right, so that's going to be a, a pretty good fire spread concern. Once again, we'll hit on ribbon boards in the uh, next one or two slides. Uh, high compartmentalization. A few of these buildings that I walk through of balloon frame construction, you can have anywhere between 12 to 25 doors. They didn't have central heating in there. They wanted to heat a small room, what currently room that they were in, whether it be a bedroom, a kitchen, stuff like that. And again, that un uninterrupted vertical and horizontal fire spread, this is where you can have light smoke showing from the exterior upon arrival, and you can lose that building in a, in a very quickly. You got, we got to be careful in this building. Start opening up too fast, start getting pressure coming down on us. High pressure seeks low pressure. Uh, the knee walls, typically going to be like your two and a half to three and a half stories. I got an air conditioning on that half story. I'm definitely going to expect, expect knee walls also. It's gonna, I'm going to expect it to be finished. Just some stuff to consider. Those knee walls can really be a hindrance to us. We're always taught to cut a hole closest to the ridge. If I've got knee walls, they're operating on that half story. The engine company's saying, hey, we got high heat. I cut a hole, I get next to nothing to come out. I'm cutting that hole like we've all been taught, cut it closest to the ridge. Now I've got that knee wall in play. If I don't bring that cut down, I'm not doing anything. So it's something we've got to anticipate. Here's an example of a inside of a balloon frame. Well, this one was pretty much currently run down. Picture to the lower left here, this is the top of the first floor wall. This is where the lath and plaster stop. I was always under the, the information that I received about balloon frame that it was one continuous piece of wood from the bottom floor to the top most floor on that building. It doesn't have to be one single piece of wood. They eventually ran out of 30 and 40 foot sticks of lumber. This picture here is a little difficult to see. They scabbed these two on. Is there a minimum requirement for that to lay over? Probably. But they just face nailed this in and continued this stud all the way up. Now that stud moved over two inches. Does that change fire tactics? Maybe not. But we've still got unimpeded vertical fire spread in this building. Now would that be considered a weak point? In my mind, yeah, but we're not going to know that. This is information that we're not always going to have. The picture to the top right, I placed my camera right there took a picture straight up. You notice one thing about this building as opposed to our houses at home, what's it missing? Insulation. Insulation. This is where you're going to have that smoke just oozing out of everywhere. These things were not tight. How they've standed the test of time, and they're still standing now, anywhere between 100 to 150 years old, I don't know. We've got homes now that are insulated just as, as good as possible, and they still leak. Oops. We talked about that ribbon board. Here's a picture right here of it. This example here has it notched into the actual studs, the continuous stud from top to bottom. Is that always the case? No. I could not find an actual law or regulation that it has to be notched or it just can be face screwed or nailed to wherever they want that floor. This is one of the things I think it was determined by the contractor currently building it what they wanted to do. Of course, this is going to be stronger. It's set in a pocket here and all these studs throughout. That ribbon board is going to be my weakest link of this building. 
that ribbon board goes, granted, my floor joists are probably nailed to all these studs, but this go, I lose a, a very large structural support. Your characteristics of balloon frame from the street, typically going to be brick veneer. You can have all those up there. A lot of Greensboro's either brick veneer or they either still have the asbestos shingles or they've went back to like a board and batten style, maybe even vinyl. So we can, the, the skin coverings on these buildings are endless. Lath and plaster is to be expected. We've probably all been in a fire of an older wood frame building that we've been assigned to overhaul. That New York hook versus lathered plaster is not fun. I'm a small frame guy. You've got to work. The chainsaw, if it'll run, can be one of your best tools inside of this structure. You're going to roll those studs just like you would be rolling a, a vertical vent hole on a wood frame residential roof. Clues from the street. Up to three and a half stories, exposed rafter tails, and narrow windows that line up. Do I have to have all three for it to be a balloon frame? No. Do I have to have any of them for it to be a balloon frame? Probably one or two, not all of them. You go in these newer housing developments. You look at the outside out of these buildings, these residential homes, wood frame. Our windows line up. It's an aesthetic thing. They don't want windows just miscued all the way around. It. Now, the Bravo and Delta side of these newer homes, they either are going to have a window one or two, or they might have none, just depending on the layout of the house. But just because I have either one or all three of those is not 100% guarantee. This is that always and never scenario that you really just got to look at. It. We've talked about the un unimpeded vertical fire spread, a vertical vent versus horizontal vent. There are studies of well-renowned firemen that have fought multiple fires in balloon frame structures. Vertical vent is a, is, is a must-do. Because the fire's going there anyways. All right. Could we make it worse? Sure, we can make anything worse. But we've got to get a, a path where that heat and smoke can go up and get out around so the interior guys can actually work and search. Horizontal vent-wise, whether you VES or you do a standard search initiated from the alpha side, if I'm operating in a bedroom, I got a door. I go in this bedroom, I shut the door. Pretty nasty smoke. Maybe not high heat, but I got nasty smoke. I want to take that window. Right now, it doesn't necessarily have to be coordinated because I am compartmentalized off from creating a flow path. I take that window, I produce victim survivability. I enhance my vision for my search. I can get it done faster and more effective. The downfall to that, if I do not control that door when I leave that room, I have caused a problem or a potential problem with flow path. So that's one thing we've got to keep in mind. We start searching these buildings. I got a lot of doors that are shut. Still need to check them because we don't know if somebody from the fire service has shut them or a civilian has shut them when they went in there to get away from the heat and smoke. Open it up from the exterior. The same people who write the vertical vent stuff on these buildings. I got fire in a wall of balloon frame structure. I get in there, I start pulling it, the engine's there, they're flowing water. The more fire, the more I open up, the more potential I have for fire and smoke to come in there. Well, I'm operating inside, so that heat and smoke is only going to go as far as it can go to that ceiling. And then it's going to start banking back down. So now I'm losing visibility, I'm increasing my heat, probably already tired at this point so what they're saying is they're saying open up from the exterior we're not going to go make large openings without a hose line close by or water flow but if I take that chainsaw I roll them studs just like I would be cutting a vertical vent hole I got fire coming out I got smoke coming out where's it go until it can't stop no more it gets out of my way I ain't got to worry about it now, from a car's perspective, it could make it things look like it's getting worse. Well coordinated, prob properly positioned hose line, we can effectively open this up. There's actually a, a nozzle that was created for these, these type of fires. It's a 90 degree bend that swivels. They would stick it in there, they'd flow up. 
and under pressure they could rotate it just the, the tip of the nozzle and flow back down to get in between those that stud void space. Investigate all areas. This is where we've really got to be careful. A lot of these balloon frames, a lot of them are going to have basements. With that being said, whether it's the officer, whether it's the whole company, whether it's the driver, your Charlie side guy, your roof man, whatever you call them, an early Charlie side report or a 270 or even a 360 is going to be crucial on this. Our city's doing better as getting on the radio as maybe a safety officer or the initial 360 officer of identifying that we have a basement. I personally would like to see, I would like us to go a little further in that. Not only do we have a basement, I'm not saying send one guy in there to completely search that basement by itself. I'm saying he needs to open that door, get in there and look and, and confirm whether there is fire in the basement or no fire in the basement. I think that needs to be reported to the battalion chief and <coughs> excuse me, and to the initial companies going through that front door. And I got a picture we'll talk about later on. These basements, they're going to be narrow, narrow stairwells. And a lot of the stairwells are stacked from the basement all the way up to the third floor. So the basement involvement can be a serious threat because now that engine company or that uh, search company is making their way through that front door. I've told them there's a basement, but I didn't tell them if fire's in the basement or not. So they don't know if they're operating over fire or not. They do know they're operating over a basement. But if I've got a fire in a basement, a balloon frame, the smoke's just going to be pouring throughout. Not going to have a really good neutral plane to read from the street. It's going to change the tactics a little bit and if I start throwing, I got fire in the basement. Uh, the collapse of these buildings can be a serious threat due to the void spaces, the, the path of travel, the fire's <coughs> got to be able to go around. So it's something we got to keep in mind. Go ahead and take, be back at 1032. It's 10 minutes. Tom. Yes, sir. Address, I will look at stuff up on Google. Oh, yeah. That's Wayne Arnold's house. Oh, wow. Long. Uh, Wayne Arnold's house. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. Wayne Arnold's house. Yeah. 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 Ye
right under a window. But man, it's 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 crazy how easily it cuts. Really? Yeah. yeah. And the yeah. dexterity you have, we all are more familiar with chainsaws as opposed to circular saws. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Just yeah. percentage of use. Um, yeah. But yeah, cutting that. Really? Yes. That's something else, Dale. Yeah. Um, if I find some more pictures, I'll send them to you. Yeah, uh, that'd be awesome. Time. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, y'all uh, should recognize 99 percent of these buildings. As soon as you pop them up, like, hey, y'all can do that, man. That's how you want to do that. All that fire steps, it's a kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'd be surprised, even the people that, that don't know that building, they're getting really, really good guesses. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what it is. It's, a good, it's an educated yeah, guess. Yeah. I've been a ton of people. Yeah. Yeah. I've been there. Yeah, the front stairway will be fun to fight fire out of, though. It's going to be like, hot. Because it's right You're going to get it as soon as you break through that door. You're going to get it as soon as you hit the yep. stairway. You yeah, you're going you're gonna to be eating it. And she's on the third floor. I know Woo. it. I know. Oh, hey, go. You best have two companies yeah, the pushing. We probably hot. Mm -hmm. The first day, I think. Yeah. yeah. So I think come in the late eight o'clock. Do what? Was it not anybody night? Yeah. 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 Uh, Seems like you and I were sitting out. Yeah, we were waiting. They gone somewhere. Well, thank you. Where? Cumberland. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's the other thing. Yeah. The world best. Did y'all go inside of like the hallway? The one on fast. The one with all the gas is the gas yeah, in the back. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Man, that's a sketch ass hallway. We actually yeah. threw some ground ladders on that one. Set the 24 on the flower bed on the opposite side and reached the third floor. Yeah, I just showed you. Yeah, that's yeah. some sketch. Yeah. Put the rings that's like a sketch. Yeah. Oh. Everybody sign this. I know I'm missing some people, but y'all are the last ones here, so. You put a rings on there. Just put Jim away. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm building a shell. Yeah. <laughs> a yard of concrete was 4,000 pounds. Cash your water. A yard of concrete. 4,050. What's the time What's that? What's the time of All right, 2,000 pounds. <laughs> a ton? <laughs> they have to say. Crazy stuff right there. Crazy stuff right there. Can't figure that one out. Oh. One big pound per square foot. Oh, man. 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 Oh, it was a Sunday. He's a nickname here. Man of leisure is what he called it. Got those two spots. Street names. I spent like six hours. Hey, I like it. Somehow, street talking turned into back door talking. That doesn't sound quite right. It's all that way. Yeah. <coughs> what about my yard now? My yard is looking great. I think I should put my yard down. 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 I think
But he was showing up on the days while I was at the station. I was pressing. I'm looking to get me one of the big zero turns because my, my riding lawnmower just mows it too low. I can't get it to mow high enough. So I got a push mower. And I worked real hard on putting my car uh, around. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. Price cross the back. I don't know. I hope they all work. Here you go. I've done. Yeah. Well, I've never had a truck in one zero. Yeah, he still talks about it. Yeah, I felt he's still got it. I felt all in my head. Sit there, and I just sit there and just bob and dump my head. And Scott kindly come back there. I can't remember what time it was. He said, if you do that again, I'm going to pull you out of the truck and beat you up. That's how we're going to do it. I'm going to go over and all of a sudden, everyone's going to go. Oh. This ain't funny, though. No. I felt better about myself, like I said, when Gary was like this. I was like, all right, it's okay for me to do it now. <laughs> That's what I told you. We were yeah, but it's four o'clock in the morning. Look, and we've been there since what ten sixteen? I think we got there. Yeah, but Gary laid down in the front yard. I said, "Yeah." He said, "Okay." Get the truck taken out. We did all we could do. Yeah, we're done. We're all done. I'm still in there at CSI going for the police tickets. But it was still in the morning. She came to me and told me she said, "Man, that house is a lot of damage." I said, the roof's going off that house. She was like, you She came up there with a She said, man, that's a few things because of the age of that computer. that I don't know, like, they're just... Wait, wait, wait. 2011, 2012, so like that. It's like some of the stuff's older. Yeah, man, you had to go back. Yeah, they got hard. My Excel stuff doesn't, like some of the stuff just doesn't jump. Like, it's very expensive. Yeah, yeah. I'm just throwing jabs right now. That was a long period. So I can go over here. Sam, how do you jail this? He's worried. That was. Yeah, that was that was the tiredest I will uh, have ever been. Well, I'm I'm understanding being in the yeah. factory. Yeah. Yeah. I went home and I got in the bed. I got sweat stains all over my head. Oh, I was bored. And then I went back to bed. It's going to be bed. Yeah, I was bored. All right, everybody, back in here. We'll start. Okay. Get back started. I think that's 90% of everybody. We'll go ahead, and, go ahead and start back. Remember early on I talked about type 6, maybe hybrid construction. Uh, it's, not, it's not new. Referring back to the 1999 article I read, they actually call it hybrid construction. So it's, it's been around for a while. It's something that we've probably fought fires in building the hybrid construction. We just didn't have it. Didn't really necessarily know a label for it yet. So here's an example of what's currently becoming a hybrid construction. This is early on. This is the old mill right there at Fairview and Knight. There's anything from a studio apartment to a two-story townhome style apartments to a random hallway that leads to two more hallways that go to four separate units. Have you been in there lately? Yes. And we'll talk about some later pictures. It looks nothing like that. Yeah. yeah, this was when they just started. Got platform style construction right there. And wasn't that going to be all parking too? Yep, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, the ceilings in here, we talk about high ceiling occupancies. That ceiling's anywhere between 30 to 35 feet. I didn't have a tape measure, but it's, it's very close to that. The apartments across from the ball field downtown. If you go look at them now, you would never know that they're the top three floors are wood frame. There's zero zero indication from the street now that it's it's wood frame. There's codes behind this. They're allowed to go a certain height. 
<clears throat> once they do that concrete first floor or fire resistive or type 2 limited combustible depends on what they're doing but the code dictates the height and that I, I don't claim to know the code book whatsoever this is the only video I got to play this twice I don't know how to fix it <laughs> a lot of wood in there what the Hampshire be a robbers Hampshire so we're now. Yes, right yeah. Down too. I mean, you, you consider it. You can consider it a hybrid because you got the apartments are wood. It's just got steel and concrete on, yeah. on the main structure. Remember, we talked about McDonald's. What's on every fast food roof? HVAC. HVAC. Got a pretty good, pretty large dead load throughout. <clears throat> now, granted, an engine company can probably sit at the front door and hit the back wall with the hose train. But with that being said, hybrid construction right here, looks like they paid the guy minimum wage, gave him half inch metal kind do it, a hacksaw, a hammer, and a drill. And he sat there and he cut them, he took the hammer, flattened both ends, drilled a hole through it, and now that's what we're going to use for our web and our parallel cord trusses. The bottom and top cord of these are two by twos. So it's math over mass now is what we're going to be de dealing with, that math over mass. You look here, you can see where they reinforce for their HVAC. That's all good and well, but it's still being supported by the parallel wood. There's, there's no, nothing else supporting that. Those are, were roughly 2 by 6s or 2 by 8s. All right, what I'm going to say about bowstrings are going to contradict and go against a lot of well-known firemen and well-known authors. I'm confident in that because I've got about six years of research, my personal research, on this. I dug deep into this because I got tired of having more questions than answers. I got frustrated with somebody telling me that this is a bowstring in, this, in the same stance the same building somebody else was telling me it was not a bowstring. With that being said, Greensboro does not have a true by definition bowstring that I have found. I've got roughly 80 pictures of arched roofs throughout Greensboro that I have personally been in and by definition it is not considered a bowstring. Disclaimer, if I say a bowstring truss because that has been ingrained in me for the 12 years that I've been in the city of Greensboro. I apologize because that is incorrect. All right. So I will try to correct myself, but it's muscle memory. It was always called a bowstring truss, bowstring truss. That's where the problem lies in the bowstring debate. So a true bowstring is not a truss. The basic definition of a truss is a top and bottom cord and the connecting pieces have to be vertically or diagonally. It has to create geometry in order for it to be a truss. Top cord in compression, bottom cord in tension, and the diagonal members and vertical members can change based on their location or the design of that truss. Terminology. We hit on terminology a little bit with the post and beam, the mortise and tendon. Terminology is a big deal in the fire service. If I look at a guy and say, I need a rabbit tool. He's never heard of a rabbit tool, but he knows what a hydro ram is. He's going to look at me and be confused. So regardless of what we call it in Greensboro, we all need to be on the same page. I would like to call it what it actually is. We don't have bowstrings in the city of Greensboro. We have steel arch trusses. The thrust of a truss is downward, so it is going with gravity. The thrust of an arch is outward, and we get a little show and tell. So, bowstring, it makes sense. We all had a bow and arrow growing up when we were little, probably. You've got a bow and a string. So this is what that interior underside is going to look like. There's a lot of requirements for it, but with that thrust of an arch, so I, know, I do not have a truss because I lack geometry, I lack vertical and diagonal web members in here. So that arch is going to thrust outward with fire. 
All right, so that's where it comes with the exterior walls getting blowed out on these bowstring style roofs, okay? I didn't build a truss for you because I ran out of time. That so. was pretty good, though. That was fun. But <laughs> that's, that's an example of how that bowstring is going to react. Platform Yeah. So I dug past fire service books. I dug past construction books. I went to the U.S. patent website. You're better off going to the library and scrolling through a Rolodex than you are operating in this website. I am not claim to be good at computers, but I spent many of hours on this website and come up with a few things. Adelbert Meekham, he patented this in 1920. Don't know when the first one was built. But that's when he, he got his patent for it. The back page here is nothing more than explaining what these numbers are, and I'm going to hit the highlights of them. Number 17 right there in the middle. In order for it to be a bowstring style arch roof, it has to have a minimum of 36, diameter, 36 millimeter diameter steel tie rod with a turnbuckle. That tie rod is not going to be the steel that we use today. It's going to be cast iron or wrought iron. It's going to react different as opposed to the steel, the reinforced stuff that we've got today, the cold drawn stuff like that. So you have to have that turnbuckle. We've all had, we've all seen the clotheslines at mom and dad's house with the old green string with the turnbuckles on the post. All it is is drawing tension. Okay? Same thing, just a larger scale. 36 millimeters, roughly that big. So it's pretty substantial. Notice we talked about it, that it can't be a truss because I lack vertical and diagonal web members. So I got on this website, I searched for bowstring. You know what come up? Bow and arrows. <laughs> about six million of them. <laughs> so I had to get creative. If you can look, you'll turn your head, you'll actually see where this is considered a truss roof arch. <coughs> Did the definition of a truss change between 19 and 20 and now? I don't know. But per today's definition, in order to be a truss, it has to have geometry. The triangle is the strongest of all shapes. These are the pictures on the next three slides that are not mine, that are not in Greensboro. I did not take these. I got these from Rio Hondo Truck Academy out of California. If you're interested in a cool class, it's a long ways to go. They do an awesome job. Their roof prop is almost 80 foot by 80 foot. <clears throat> but with that being said, this bowstring here, this is another example of it. I've got my turnbuckle here, my cast iron or wrought iron tension rod, these verticals here. I've actually got a picture that has the verticals in it in a true bowstring roof that is that was standing out there in Rio Honda. All it, that support right there, all it does is, is holding the resistance of gravity on that turnbuckle and that tie rod. It's just helping support it to keep it straight. I don't know the weight of those tie rods. I imagine they're fairly heavy. I do not have an exterior picture of these buildings. I emailed the guy. He said, I don't know where that building was, whether it burnt down, whether he just forgot the address, but he was not unable to go back and take an exterior picture of it. On down deeper in the bowstring. Exterior wise, it should have an abutment or a pillar. Uh, shoot, lost the name of it. It's going to have like a stair step made out of masonry right here. A buttress. Sorry about that. It's going to have what's called a buttress. So that buttress is going to be in direct line of all my bowstring arches. So it's going to tell me my spacing from the exterior. It's combating that lateral force that that, that bow, that top cord made of wood is pushing out on that load bearing wall. So that's, an, that's a, a telltale sign from the street as opposed to just assuming all arch roofs are bowstrings. That technically is incorrect. But if I do have those buttresses, that's going to be a better indicator that maybe I'm operating in a bowstring. Hackensack, New Jersey, Ford dealership. It's famous for the title being Firefighters Die in Bowstring Collapse. 
I have not read the full entire report. I read the summary report. It was a wood arch truss. There was several accounting factors due to that. One of them was an unapproved truss law filled with motors and, and who knows what. In the report it goes down to the breakdown of how many pounds per square foot was up there. It was unapproved. It was not permitted. Several more factors were involved in it. A true bowstring, you cannot, you cannot floor that because that tie rod is made for tension. It is not made for compression. Some of these pictures are really, really grainy. Another thing from the exterior of a true bowstring roof, it's not going to have the butt truss at the ends as opposed to the steel arch trusses that we got here in Greensboro. It's just going to, the arch is just going to go to the exterior wall and straight down. Now can you have a steel arch truss that does that? Absolutely. Can't see the turnbuckles in this picture, but you can see the horizontal tie rods. Pretty large substantial wood top member there. And this just shows where the red arrows are of how they're tied into each other. This would be more along the lines of like a, a double bowstring arch. Load bearing columns there. Again, these are from Rio Hondo. This is a store that is similar to like our, maybe our Ace Hardware on a larger scale. Pretty good sized building just looking at this picture. Remember those optional support rods that we talked about earlier. That's what you're seeing here. Some of them are supporting some of these lights. But most of them are supporting the actual tie rod itself with that 36 millimeter cast iron or wrought iron. If you look right there on that red arrow, there's my turnbuckle. Pretty much in the middle of this building. Goes all the way back on every single one of them. This is going to react totally different than the steel arch trusses that we have currently in Greensboro. I personally would like to get NIST and UL to do a full-scale study of this and maybe get some clarification on the bowstring versus the steel arch truss. Has not been done yet. But I'm going to anticipate a whole, <coughs> a, a totally different style collapse of this building as opposed to my steel arch trusses. Just a zoomed in picture. It looked a whole lot better on my computer, and then I put it up here, and then it got really, really grainy. But that's just an example. It was just showing that turnbuckle. Again, I don't have exterior pictures of this building. I really wanted them, but was unable to get them. Here's just how it's tied in. We have the luxury here of seeing these columns here that's supporting my roof structure, my bowstring arch. So from the exterior, I'll be able to gauge with, on this building the spacing that I'm operating on, whether it be 16, 20, 24 foot on center. I got a double substantial wood top cord here. The question I don't have the answer to, does that tie rod go all the way through to the exterior wall? I don't know. I imagine it has to based on how it's sandwiched in between these two wood top cord members. Is that an indication from the exterior? Maybe. I still have a lot of questions with the bowstring, but like I said, I'm very confident in the research that I've done that we've adopted the, the wrong terminology based on what we have here in Greensboro. This portion of the class, I know y'all have seen this before. This is going to be like the interactive portion. I got this idea from Mettendorf and Dodson, the Art of Reading Buildings. They finally did a PowerPoint about two, two and a half, three years after they uh, wrote the book. I personally, they just had random buildings. They didn't have the interior pictures of them, so they didn't have the answers to all their questions. They played the what if game and the maybe game. I should have enough pictures after the video, and some of them are still pictures because we couldn't fly the drone all the way around these buildings. But I'm going to have the answers to most of your questions. So, with that being said, we're going to keep this acronym in, in our brain the STU or STUI. The height, size, one through five. Keep type six in your brain, maybe hybrid construction. 
the occupancy we've hit on that a lot it's going to indicate what we're going to what we should encounter once we break the threshold of that door and the time period it was built i do have the dates on this slide so we'll know the answers to when they were built here's another one of uh station one's territory 2001 North Church Street. Old building or new building? New. new? All right. Last, what, 10 years? Yes. Where the old painted plate Last used to be. Last two years. Three years. Is that that uh, doctor's office right there? It is. Triad Foot Center. Type of construction? Two. Type two? All right. Got some tall windows there. What do we think behind that? Stairs. Stairs. Office. Maybe like a cathedral style. Don't pay attention to the husband and wife arguing. <laughs> I don't know what they was arguing about, but they weren't happy with each other. <laughs> Once again, I got windows that line up. Don't always indicate it's a balloon frame. Got a lot of windows. Out beside door. Now I got a door on Delta. We know now that the first floor is a doctor's office. What am I thinking I'm going to encounter? Offices, rooms, visiting rooms, maybe a large area in the center. That's something pretty cool there. This is why that 360 or that Charlie side report is big. That's probably not their standard trash chute that they use. It's not there anymore. Not there anymore, yeah. I think they finally finished it. But now we're pretty under, under, we can assume the second floor is either not finished or they're doing heavy renovations. One thing that's odd about this Charlie side here, it's got a parapet. Why does it have a parapet? Probably because there's parking all the way around. Aesthetically, it looks better. So now I'm thinking about my roof, thinking about direction of travel. Pretty decent sized building. I don't know the, the dimensions on it. I didn't take a measuring rule out there. We got some more of them high glass windows here on the Charlie side. We'll run down to Delta. Pay attention to that roof line. What is What are these things? Drains. Roof drains or roof scuppers. What does it indicate? That's where the roof water stops. Yep. That's telling me the height of my parapet. I can get that information from the ground. Those All lines right. going down the middle of the, the you, you saw every like 10 or 15 feet there were lines going down the middle of it. Mm -hmm. Is that is there like a truss plate? So what that probably is, the uh, high-rise downtown, it's real brick, but it's put up in 10 by 10 pieces. They brick that 10-story high-rise downtown in six weeks as opposed to doing it by hand, it'd take over six months. So they're panels mm -hmm. lifted up with a crane, they're welded in place. Do these have them? I don't know. That's probably just a standard brick facade. They did it for aesthetics. What am I expecting to be on my roof? What kind of roof coverings? We said we said it's a type two. Is that what we're going with? Membrane. Rubber membrane. What's what going to be my supporting structure in a type two? Steel. Unprotected steel. Maybe open web bar joist. Four to six foot. It's a good indicator. A good assumption in Greensboro. Rubber membrane would be correct. Remember we talked about earlier about roof direction of travel of my structural members. This is a better picture to determine. Which way do I think they're running? A to C or B to D? Alpha Charlie. Alpha to Charlie. So now you can see what I was explaining earlier. As opposed to running Bravo to Delta, I've got a larger area here that that can spread its weight across. That's something I can gain very, very quickly. Whether I have a whole company ladder in the building, whether I have one guy riding in the bucket just getting eyes on it, or whether I go ahead and commit to that building to give a report. What am I expecting under this rubber membrane? Q metal decking. Q metal decking. All right. Maybe some insulation. This roof is really odd. 
This is what's known in the residential wood frame uh, world as an inverted butterfly roof. So I have a parapet all the way around. I can't run my single pitch all the way to the trolley side now. If you'll notice this ponding here in the middle. If I had pretty decent smoke in here and I saw the roof looking like it's sagging in the middle, it could give me a misnomer. It could be very misleading. But if I've got ponding already, you look over here, you can see where it falls. Tyler. Yes. Question. Um, think about um, Elm Street with Sterling. You got, uh, <coughs> is there an indication of some of you noticed that has like a, let's say the roof coat sags on one side and you think, well, there's a firewall or low bearing wall separating that, you know, you know, pull everybody off the roof or is there an indicator to say, well, no, there's something here like that. They thought there was something separating the, there was a wall that protruded through. Is there something that indicates that in your study? Not on all of them. I would treat it like there's not one there. If there's one there, that plays in our hand. I expect this building to be a drop ceiling as soon as I walk in. Nothing's, no load bearing walls, probably some supports throughout. But I'm not expecting firewalls here. Remember we talked about that open web bar joist stuff? It's nothing more than balloon frame rotated 90 degrees. Yeah. So my, my fire, heat, and smoke travel can go wherever it wants to a lot of the times in these. But I don't know of a true all the time or even a good indication of it being a draft stop or firewall. I know the code, it changes probably every 10 years, but just because it's a firewall, it doesn't have to protrude now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the indicators that we lose. All right, so we said Alpha to Charlie for my travel. We said corrugated metal decking. We said uh, metal bar joist. That would be correct. One thing we can't always determine is if it's going to be a large single span or multiple short spans. Based on the picture and me walking through this building from girder to girder is anywhere between 20 to 24 feet. Now, this is, it's called a girder because of the way it's used. This is not something on our go back that we would mark as a heavy steel truss. That's a, for a different class. This is nothing more than an I-beam or steel H-beam that's supporting my, my roof structure. The benefit to that, I now have an area where fire and smoke cannot necessarily readily keep going. I'm not always going to have the luxury of being able to see this. This is the stuff that's going to be covered up. The height of this floor is anywhere between 14 to 16 foot. Remember, we go in there, we start walking through these buildings. Every time we walk through a door, we need to pop a ceiling tile. Get our idea of our ceiling space, our interstitial void space. Are those trusses, are those standard PSI steel trusses, or are they required to be higher rated? I've looked a little into the PSI steel. I don't know a whole lot about them. Uh, there is a minimum requirement for all of them based on what the roof load is, the location and the, uh, and the weather and all that. But I, I really don't know. Uh, like I said, I know there's a minimum requirement and a minimum standard, but it all starts getting into how wide open I'm getting if I've got a longer span. Of course, the longer span, I'm going to be a much higher from top cord to bottom cord. Uh, Greensboro's full of like 16. Still is 36,000 psi. I know some stuff's 50 to 80,000 psi. Yeah. And I was just wondering if they used the 50,000 psi still. So this. that's some of that stuff that superintendent downtown was spitting out faster than I could write down and faster than I could soak up. Um, very very intelligent man, um, but he was spitting out the numbers like that, and I'm sure there's indications. I just don't know of, of all of them yet because it's a lot of numbers to remember. Um, now, when they first started doing trusses, we we started we got trusses, these parallel cords and bridge style trusses from the actual train industry. That's where they they come from. You can have a clear span. Back then, when they were doing it with the bridge truss, 
They were spanning up to 170 feet unsupported. <laughs> Probably not going to see that today, but that's what they were capable of doing. This is the standard size height-wise that we're going to encounter in Greensboro. You also can remove this right here and place another steel truss, but now it's going to be called a girder because of the way it's used. A girder is nothing more than a, a beam that supports other beams. When I lay all this stuff down on the ground, it's all called the same thing. It's all based on how it's used. Not necessarily fire-related. It's kind of cool. We talked about that inverted roof or that butterfly roof. What do we think that white pipe is? Drain. 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 The building we're sitting in now has roof drains that run right through the middle of it. What we would consider lightweight all uh, metal studs. This building, they did do an excellent job of caulking around all the pipes in their sheetrock. Their firewalls were, were pristine. Very, very well done and they were proud of the work they did. So we said it was a type two. I was unable to get into the first floor due to COVID being a doctor's office. They didn't really want me taking pictures in there. So this is a question I have. What do we got here? This is the first floor. We got fire resistant on that protective steel. Why they did it, I don't know. The other question I do not have an answer to is that entire floor fire resistant. I don't know. Like I said, the COVID, the doctor's office kind of shut me down and keep me out of there. Is that, one, is that continuous all the way through the building, or is it? It's supported throughout. Yeah, it's, it's, it's too, too long to, to go unsupported. Okay. Um, but you can see just by people's hands walking up these stairs how they've already started to remove this monocut. Personally, I think it looks horrible. They should have they should have boxed it in or done the encasement style with sheetrock. Why they did it, I'm not sure. And I, like I said, I don't know if that spans throughout. The picture of the to the right. I lost my picture somewhere in the hard drive world of a curtain wall, the building downtown that we got to train on several years back. It was either eight to ten stories somewhere in there, maybe seven solid glass front. If I see that in these buildings, I'm going to anticipate what's considered and called a curtain wall. If you look real close, you got four inch blocks here that are uh, hollow metal. That's where it's welded. That's all, the only support minus the ground bearing that it has to be supported to that wall. It's just a skin. So granted, nothing right here is going to readily burn, but I've got unimpeded vertical smoke and fire spread through there based on that curtain wall. And when you start getting into multiple floors with them, we can have the same instance like you'll have in the type one in that main artery that goes up with the HVAC. You got a fire on one floor, I've got reports of smoke on however many floors you want to play throughout. This is where we couldn't do a fly around just due to the houses, the location, so we got some still pictures. Old or new? Old. All right. What do we think is the occupancy style? Well, before I do that, how old? 20s, 40s, 18s? What are we talking about? Type 4, maybe? Okay. Look like some kind of renovation. All right, some renovations? Oh, it looks probably using 1910, a, uh, 19... commercial business now. 100? 1900, that's a good guess. Like, like I said, we're shooting for that 10 to 15 year range. 1918. So we've got type 4. What else are we thinking? We, we think anything else? Balloon, balloon frame, so that'd be type 5. So let's talk about the balloon frame for a minute. Narrow windows, they all line up. I've got exposed raptor tails throughout. I've got my half story. I've got multiple chimneys. And multiple chimneys is a good indicator because, remember, they didn't have central heating and air. Those chimneys typically are located in a kitchen or a bedroom. So those multiple chimneys is just another read. Random thought on this one. This is considered historical. They were not allowed to put heavy equipment on this site. That trench there is about three foot deep and it was hand dug. So, Note to self, don't take up any work on historical sites. 
So balloon frame, we know they typically have basements or we have any indication from the alpha side here that there's a basement. The grade of the land is kind of new. Maybe, so it's a possibility. Here's a video of the Charlie side. We're going to size this Charlie side up. That right there, I'll tell you, it leads to a door. So we got a lot of windows. Is this on some? This is the uh, 600 block of Elm Street. What do I got down here? Basement. Basement. Four meters is odd. So I've already got one door on the Charlie side. That one there. Got a smaller window here, what we're thinking? Bathroom, Bathroom maybe? Yeah. So there's another door. That's three doors now. And now I have a door that leads to nowhere. <laughs> and then there's five. So I've got five paths for me to get inside to conduct a search in this building on two sides. Where are you going to go? That's where that recon and us getting in there before that engine company is really going to help them out. They start stretching in these doors, don't know where they're going. I think the door that leads to nowhere, I think that one time there was a deck there. It has since been renovated, torn down, fell down, whatnot. Could have been. So, behind the door that leads to nowhere, what are we going to expect behind that door? What kind of room? Maybe a kitchen. Kitchen's 100% correct. So the weird thing about this, we got to notice four meters. This building was originally designed to be a four unit apartment building in 1918. The layout is flawless. Remember we talked about, we talked about getting eyes on the basement, not just saying that there's a basement, but looking in there and confirming fires in the basement or not. The picture to the right is coming up from the basement. You're looking about 32 to 36 inch wide stairwell. We're already operating in something smaller, Halligan's 30 inches. The reason we need to find out very quickly and very early on before they really start crossing the threshold of this alpha side, if I've got fire in the basement, a lot of these stairs line up. What do we think right, this is? That's the underside of those. We send guys in the search. They do a split. They do a first floor and second floor search. I told them they had a basement, but I didn't open the door to look in to see if there was any fire involvement down there. Stairs burn out. Where are they going? Down All the way to the bottom. Yeah. So that's where I personally would like to see. We take that extra five seconds, open that door, whether it needs to be forced or whether it needs to be open. Get eyes in there. Do we have smoke? Yes or no. Do we have fire? Yes or no. The radio traffic is, object, is subjective to whatever you want to say. I think it needs to be clear and concise. Uh, be advised. Have a basement. No fire involvement. Maybe something of that nature. Picture to the left here is anywhere between 8 to 12 foot inside the front door. Opens up to a pretty nice hallway like common breezeway area. Apartment 1 is on the left, apartment 2 is on the right. You go up the stairs, apartment 3 is on the left, apartment 4 is on the right. The original numbers and the original hardware on all these doors are still there. There, was, there had to be close to 20 doors in this, in this building. It was just cut up. Now they're actually currently renovating it, running new water lines, new power, stuff like that. The roof of my building, what am I expecting? We already know it's a wood frame. We're saying it's a balloon frame. We know it's old. So am I expecting lightweight lumber? No. True dimensional. Nice heavy. Maybe some tongue and groove stuff. Two by eights, two by tens. Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go to that. I do have a ridge board. So that's good if I got a lay a roof ladder on it because that's typically what is supporting us. True dimensional lumber, we know it's old. We got our old wood insulators here, or the insulators for the wiring. 
the downfall of this roof that we're not going to know. And this comes with practice on the roof prop and also experience. The roof prop out there, we're cutting 7 716 7 OSB, whether it be 16 or 24 on center. Depends on where our wood's placed that day. I've got pretty good dexterity in that chainsaw to roll those rafters. I don't have a whole lot of material for my deck. This one is going to be a little different. We can play the side of luck, which we all know is not going to happen. I plunge my saw in between my skip decking or my skip sheathing, which is original to this type of building. I plunge it right in, I cut OSB. I don't have a lot of resistance. I have good dexterity in the chainsaw. I can fill and roll my rafters. On the flip side of that, I'm gonna, you're probably going to drop that saw dead center of this 1x6. You're going to have the same feeling throughout. You're not going to fill those rafters. You're not going to roll them. You're going to cut through them. Am I worried if I cut two rafters in this roof that the building's going to fall down? No. It's not a huge concern. Remember, we're operating on true dimension on here. These are 2 by 8s or 2 by 6s I, I didn't have my tape measure. But I plunge that saw in there, and it's just, it's just working that thing. Maybe it crosses in my mind that this, this could be it. Maybe this is our issue. What do we do? Take that saw, move it two inches over. Try again. I don't know. It's just things that we got to keep in the back of our head because we all know that we're not going to get lucky on these cuts and drop directly in OSB. I personally have not sounded a roof that I have known this to be with the skip decking and skip sheeting along with 7 16 or half inch OSB and then whatever roof coverings. I don't know if you can determine that. I don't know how the thud is. I don't know how the bounce is. I just don't, I, I've never operated on a roof that I know of like this. So that sounding, I don't know. Something that if you get a chance to do, let me know, because I'd like to know. It's a pretty cool building. Downtown right at the railroad tracks across from Natty Green. Type of construction, what do we think? Three. Three? Three? Huh? Old or new? 1930s. 1930s, That's all right? Been renovated, yeah. Has been renovated, that's good. Notice odd it's stair step on. here. Stars on. Yeah. Yeah, let's get a pair of along the top. We think all those stars are real. We think some of them are ornamental. A little bit of both. A little bit of both. All right. Got narrow windows that line up. Once again, not always an indicator balloon frame. You can really start to date these buildings when you start seeing the brick arches as opposed to steel or concrete lentils. This is when they start to get old. I actually found something out about this building last night that's really cool. So we're going 1930s. I'll give you the answer. It's 1880s. Nope. Thank you. Is this a construction company? Yes, this is Christiana Construction. Yeah, that's pretty cool inside. Very beautiful building. So it's a construction company, so we can anticipate probably stuff that really don't need to be done, but stuff that they're going to use for a showroom. That's pretty cool. So we've said ordinary. we got old brick, old-looking mortar. Actually found a picture of it in 1904 when all the stuff on the side was still painted. Beautiful. So I got three stories right here in the front on the alpha side. Notice those stars. Look at the angle that they're at. Good indication it could be the roof line. I actually have external tie rods on this building. Notice I didn't have a parapet on the Charlie side. So we know it's we're calling it ordinary. What is my roof covering? What am I expecting? Uh, rubber membrane. Rubber membrane? Rubber All right. Or wood could sheathing? Could be, yeah, could be wood sheathing, could be a rubber membrane. We know it's been renovated now. Here's the answers. From front to back of that building is probably close to a 10 to 15 foot elevation drop. One more reason why we've got to get eyes early on to give a report to that chief. Now I can give him, chief, a parapets are supported throughout the building. 
Were they there originally? I doubt it. That was probably due to the construction and the renovation. I did talk to the people who renovated it. They took it down to nothing but the exterior brick walls. They completely gutted this building. Skylights were probably not original. <laughs> I tried to get up there to get actual pictures from the rooftop. They were more than willing to let me up there. The roof hatch was broke, so we settled for a drone picture. What's the building on top of it? Is that it? Some sort of HVAC stuff. Okay. Like I said, I really wanted to get up there, and I really wanted to get up there after because I had the same question. Uh, it's not a bulkhead. It's not an elevator. I do know that. Um, could it be? Maybe. It looks more like a, a metal covered building or a metal structure as opposed to like a stairwell or elevator shaft. Probably not going to have an elevator in a building this old and it not being but three stories. We'll talk about skylights for a minute. If I take a skylight, I can vertically vent stuff really quick with skylights. If I got a report of inside, I've got light smoke from an engine company reporting inside. I take that skylight, smoke just billows out. That means my ceiling's probably still intact and I got a fire above them, maybe in a cock loft. Same thing, they got heavy smoke. I take it, I get the same thing, heavy smoke. All right, so now I could be operating on a skylight that's been framed out throughout the cock loft to go down to the underside of the ceiling to allow light in. So a good rule of thumb, if I take a skylight, I'm typically going to take it maybe with a Halligan or a New York hook. Clear the window, clear the skylight, put that thing in at an angle. If I meet resistance, it's probably framed out. Do I need to take it? Do I not need to take it? That's going to be dictated on the conditions inside and the reports from inside, outside, and topside reports. They've all got a match throughout the event. Talk about renovations. This is not original. This is the construction company showing what they can do. This is a micro lamb LVL. Probably closer to 2 by 16 very substantial. They can pull a span a whole lot longer than what they've done here. Uh, some of these, depending on the height of them, can span unsupported for up to 70 feet. But you're operating the LVL is laminated veneer lumber. This stuff is very, very, very strong. On the same side of that, it will burn hot and it will produce some nasty smoke because of the glue. So we talked about them tie rods. The answer is all of them are real. Prior to going into this building and digging deep into building construction over the last few years, I was always under the interpretations tie rod went from exterior wall to exterior wall. That is not true. Because if that was the case, when they tightened that tie rod, they would do nothing but pull the walls in until they collapsed. So there's nothing to brace them. So I gotta have a resistance if I'm gonna get that turnbuckle in there. This right here, from this LVL to the end here, is solid wood. That's their anchor. That's where that tie rod on the delta side is going is coming it's to. Coming from the other side back into that. Okay. Yep. I got you. And this one here is going to another one. It's going to another one just like this on the other side. All throughout the whole. All room. throughout. So they're different. Okay. First floor, second floor, and even that third floor little apartment type thing up there. Notice it is sprinkler. It's just a picture of the LVL micro lamps. You can really get into some a lot of mathematics when you start getting on those websites. This right here is a waste of money. Once again, they're showing what they can do. That's all it is. That's a lot of money sitting there for absolutely no reason. Now you can get a better idea of the roof, that roof pitch. It's substantial. You throw a little water up there, sawdust, if you're cutting on it, you may or may not just like a slip and slide. You got rubber membrane. Something to keep up in the back of your head. You can see throughout here, look what he's talking about, that's supported from the Bravo, or excuse me, Delta, support from a Delta, and it goes every other bay throughout. They're also in the roof. Now, 
that, is that the way that it would originally have been done? Now this is a this building's been remodeled. Yes. So on the older buildings that have those tie rods, are they built that same way? Probably not to this scale, but they should not go from, it should not be the same tie rod from Bravo to Delta on the exterior. They've got to be anchored somewhere. Cool fact about this building. It was originally, the first floor, it was originally a taxpayer. First floor was commercial, second floor was apartment, and the third floor was an apartment. That's from GIS. So based on the exterior of this building, you could be right if you, would, if you wanted to call it a taxpayer. This is A&T's campus. The downfall to this, anything owned by the government, you're not going to find out what year it was built. It's not public record. UNCG, Guilford College, Bennett College, A&T, you're not going to find anything on them. So I do not know when this was built. I, I'm going to say 60s to 70s. It's in the 50s or the 60s because I, I, the old Scott, the old one they tore down, was uh -huh. built about the same time that that one was built. Okay. I, I'm guessing. I yeah, then that's fine. What do we expect right here? All right, so maybe center hallway? Uh, type of construction? One? I think one's a good guess. There's stuff in the code, I don't claim to know the code, but once you read a certain height and the occupancy, you've got to go to fire resistance. Due to this being a dorm, I'm going to say it's a high chance of it being fire resistant. It's going to be a lot of concrete and a lot of steel. Got a center door here. Once again, another building that I was not granted access to because of one, the college campus was closed down, and two, COVID. Pretty decent sized building, I believe it's seven stories, 100 footer, we can reach, we can, we can catch most of this building with our scrub area. Got a mimic, same thing on Bravo here, maybe it's a stairwell as well, what do we think this is? Elevator, really. Elevator, absolutely. <laughs> Learn this from an engine company. What are these things right here? The vents up top? The piece on the roof line. Hey, we'll go back. Those right there. Yeah. I tell you, it's a standpipe with a PIV. I don't claim to know engine company functions at all. Apparently, that is just for testing it. Can it be used? Absolutely. All right, so we're going to say type one. So what am I expecting my roof? Concrete, probably steel, yeah. Pretty deep, pretty deep building. There's your kicker. There is zero parapet, not even enough that you can slide a quarter and it stop it all around this room. <clears throat> you throw a little spoke up there, you start sounding, and there you go. This is unique. This is what I would call a light well or a light shaft. Do you have any pictures from the inside of them? I do. <laughs> that was my original. It looks like an old prison. It's horrible. It used to be an all girls dorm. That's what a guy told me. And the guy's like, I was like, how'd you know that? He's like, well, I've been in it. I was like, well, you can tell me the answers. He started, and he's like, nah, nah, nah. It's been a long time. <laughs> but let's throw some. Embassies are like that. Embassy suites. One in Charlotte. Yeah. Yeah. Like that. Yep. But look, you can look here, there is zero parapet, there is nothing to stop you. Nothing. I got my roll-on roofing. It's like 80 weight. I don't, I don't really remember that. I get that stuff from Gary Jones. I got somebody trapped on the fourth floor. How am I getting them? Some ideas. 
Roof road. Has it been done in Greensboro? No. Is it something that we can do? Absolutely. We don't have to wait on the rescue. The res we don't always have time for the rescue to show up. It's got to be something that's practiced. You can't do it for the first time on an event. Another thing. Took a class in Charlotte. OJ Calusi, Dark Side of Ladders. Scale them. The hooks on a roof ladder rated 500 pounds each. I'm not going to get no unconscious victim down. But if I got somebody trapped maybe right here on three or four, that railing ain't going nowhere. It's set in the concrete. It's probably solid steel. Now, we did it. We had all the safeties in place with the ropes, the tie-offs, and everything. And it's a pretty cool adrenaline rush to climb up a side of a building on the railings. Same thing. It's not something you're going to do for the first time on a call. It needs to be practiced. If that has to take place, you better be light. That air pack's got to go. Your center of gravity's got to be your normal day-to-day -day stuff. But it's just ideas, just options. Can I get a 35 in there? Yeah, one man's not going to be very fun, but I can get it in there. So, ideas to keep in mind. This is the meal, of course, at Fairview and 9th. At 14, we had to pre-plan for this building. The newest to oldest building spanned over 100 years before they started tearing them down. Very cool building. I like these buildings. So we know it's old. We know it's a meal. But it looks like they're doing a lot of work to it. Now I'm going to expect renovations. Some standalone buildings here. I got a few pictures of the interior of those. Just cycle through some of these pictures. I did talk to the superintendent. This will, he says it should be good enough to support a ladder truck. Should be. <laughs> will it fit? Yeah. It's pretty good opening. The outriggers on 100 footers, less than 20 foot, it'll fit. I'm operating on that longitudinal axis. I don't really have to worry about being real soft ground. But that is something that they were saying it should be graveled up to a certain point, and it's going to be like a little courtyard area here. Tyler, I missed what you said. You're saying where you put a ladder truck? Mm -hmm. You can go down an alley? It so need be can... maybe defensive operations or something like that. Um, it, per the code, he was saying that they had to leave that open for us. For access for us. We know this building's big. You get a small fire in this building, you ain't gonna know it from the exterior. You're gonna find it when you get in there. That's why we gotta be ready. Captain, you brought up the parking garage. All this slick, pretty concrete here is the parking garage. This is the hallway. These are apartments. I asked him about ventilation, what he's gonna do. Cars parked in there. It's not going to be heated. So these people in the wintertime are going to start their cars up. What are you doing about CO? He said, we got that fixed. So we put in four 24-inch wide squirrel cage fans on each end. Squirrel cage fans don't have motors. They rely on the heat evacuating out of here or the wind blowing. A car fire in here, engine one, is going to have a, a good time. Yes, we are. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of problems with a small incident in here. You have subject to, there's north of 150 apartments going to be in this building. Was it still just that one entrance and exit at the very end? Uh, the, when I talked to him, that was going to be it. It was one way in, one way out no. for the parking garage. Hmm. There is also going to be extra parking in the old basement underneath majority of this building. Rescue 5 is probably going to be familiar with this building because they're going to tear the columns down. I mean, it's, it's going to be a, a learning curve for all of us. Mm -hmm. I say if you, get a, if you go to ENT and you got an hour and a half for lunch, go spend a few minutes walking through here. It's really cool. So now I've got cars parked four to six foot away from my main entrance to my apartments. Roughly 300 foot, maybe 400 foot long. 
Tyler, I, okay, it's, it's going to be sprinkled. Yes. Um, dry system in there because you said they're not heating it. Yep. Okay. With that being said, Chief, you got your standpipe hook up here. So I'm standing right here. Turn to my left, take a picture of this standpipe. They're going to sheetrock this. Yes. Separation from the parking garage. We're probably going to be assigned to find it for the engine company. If I come in down here, I'm in this building over 350 feet before I find this. There's rules that can only be spaced so far apart. It's like 150 feet, and then there's one for 250 feet. This one's probably closer to your 150 to 175 foot spacing from each to each one. There's two on each side, but if I'm looking for a standpipe in a parking garage, I'm typically not looking behind sheetrock. I personally think that's there for code enforcement and for show because it's not going to get used. Because like I said, I'm in past my search rope if I make entrance from that end right there. Well past my search rope. Small incident in here can, can, can turn. We can have us a nice conflagration really quick. This is going to be the, the slow down. We've got to really find our best access to get in here before we start deploying multiple companies and stretching hoes. This is those standalone buildings that I pointed out in the aerial picture. It's not original. They put back parallel cord wood. It's just like my metal bar joist. I got unimpeded vertical and horizontal fire spread. I ask you to do your own research on gussets. There's a lot of misleading information out there. Research them. They're not popping off. They're not pinging off of concrete floors. Actually a very strong, very sturdy support. If you've been in the fire service, I've been told for any length of time, you probably know this building. MLK in Oxford. It's the radio repair shop, also known as Fonville. So we talk about signage, radio repair, I'm not expecting a very nice open area. Old or new? Ooh. Type of construction? Three. Three? All right. Three or five? I'm good with that. The angle of the drone gives it a misleading. It's not an arch. It does have a pitch to it. This is my second roll up, another man door with an odd on commercial buildings right here. <laughs> that all one all the way through from that uh, that long like from the mid section back, is that like a long store like a there is a wall in between them, but it's got doors. It's not no fire separation. Oh. So I got exposed rafters. Am I expecting lightweight wood? True dimensional? All right. Rafters? Stick built? Yeah, probably rafters. Ridge pole. Ridge pole, all right. 1928. I got to look because there's a lot of numbers in my brain. 1928 was the original build date. This building's pretty cool. Mm. Is that what you expected? Nope. Not exactly. So this is more, more of a rigid arch truss. It is a truss. I got vertical, diagonal web members supporting the top cord and the bottom cord. That bottom cord there is almost six inches by six inches. So now I'm flirting with maybe type four stuff. Mm -hmm. Don't have all the requirements for it to meet it, but I got surface to mass ratio. This one, I've got mass over math instead of what we encounter today, which is just the opposite, math over mass. As a truck company, can I operate on this? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a playground. <laughs> it's heavy. It's heavy. 24-ohm center, tongue and groove, maybe one by sixes. Side note, this is where I found my Pompeer ladder. <laughs> There it is, right there. 
The only stipulation for this gentleman let me come in here was not wake up the cats behind door number one. <laughs> I did not go in there because there was probably 30. Oh, Jesus. So, I crawled in on top of everywhere in this building. The guy was awesome. Side note, back to the Palm Pier. I was actually told the old station four directly down the road from this. A guy come to him when they took us out of service. He said it was from Greensboro. There's no paperwork on it. But he said it was given to them from that station. It was given to his dad. It's now currently still at 14 because I have not have a time to finish my basement to take it home with me. What is going on? Hmm? What is going on? It's going on, yes. 20 bucks is what I gave for it. There's one online for 908. Felt bad after I left. Gee, I see that. <laughs> <laughs> he said 20 bucks, not me. Oh, God. So back to the buildings here. I asked the guy, I said, do you remember this being added on? He said, no, I was a kid. I don't remember. So now we're getting into some tied stuff, some rigid arches, rigid arch trusses. This runs from the bottom cord to the top cord. Keep in mind that bottom cord on this one right here is like 2 by 12. And there's one, two, three, four, and then a scab on here. So I've got some heavy timbers in here. I've got surface to mass ratio. I've got mass over mass. Very well supported as to pose of 811 South Elm Street. That different style building, but we're talking about how they're connected. 811 was set on one course of brick. This one's set on a full block that's probably got poured concrete in it. So my connection point's a lot stronger right here. This here's probably an add-on for structural stability. And that was either a 4x4 four four or 6x6. Six six. I can't remember. It's very heavy. Got old-style brick. But yes, we can operate on that. I hate when that button sticks. We can operate on that for a pretty decent time. Like I said, the inside, the top side, and the outside reports always have to match. Huffman Street. Pretty sure this building's been for sale in my 12 years in Greensboro. <laughs> Signs never moved. Never changed, nothing. So, type of construction? Two. All right, two. Notice we, got a, we do have an arch in this roof here. I got a man door. Roll up with a dock. Another man door, roll up with a dock. Now what am I starting to think? Warehouse. Warehouse. Maybe, maybe subdivided. I have no indication of firewalls poking through. And now for some reason, somebody wanted skies. Another roll up. She uses a swimming pool. A few gas meters. Really long building. Old or new? Newer. Newer, all right. 60, 60, 70, 60, 70s, all right. Pretty good guesses. It's about built in 53. That 50s, 60s, to 70s, they really didn't change a whole lot. Uh, they're very, very close, very similar. Uh, roof's obviously been re, re rubbered. Uh, you can't read this sign here, but we talked about signage and our size up. That's Architectural Salvage Company. What am I expecting? Stuff. Bunch of scrap. old stuff that don't have no rhyme or reason, no layout. I can look in the window and tell you that it's a conglomerate of mess. Now, if you like old stuff, probably make a trip into this building. He's got like 40 claw foot tubs. Yeah. He's got like a 1910 Ford truck. I mean, just anything old this gentleman has. Uh, Roof-wise, what am I expecting? Metal, wood, both? All right, so maybe wood decking, okay. What's going to be supporting that wood decking? Wood arches. Huh? Wood arches. Wood arches, all right. So in my studies of Greensboro, 99% of the buildings that you see from the exterior with an arch like this are going to be steel arch trusses, 20 foot on center, 16 on center, 2 by 8s or 2 by 10s, with 
a tongue and groove style decking. There is a wall here. Do not know if it is fire rated or not. It does go all the way to the ceiling, but it is split up. I do not remember if there was a door there either. I, 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 I think there was, but I don't want to tell you wrong. How many separations are in that building? How many walls are in there? Three separate units to two walls. Was that original? I don't know. Probably not. Can I operate on this roof? Mm -hmm. Yes. That being said, is percentage involvement. Steel's going to heat up. If I got interior crews in there, flowing water, cooling this steel, getting a good knockdown, reading my smoke, yeah, I've got a pretty substantial wood roof over top of this. Collapse wise, if I lose one and they're 20 foot on center, if I lose one truss, one arch truss, 20 foot on center, 40 foot hole. Is that catastrophic? It can be. Exactly right. Based on the percentage of that building and the square footage of it. If I drop a 40 foot hole in this building that's a city block long, maybe, maybe not. That's all goes back to that percentage involvement, location of fire, and how we're doing, how much longer that building's going to allow us to, to operate in there. But most of the buildings, like I said, I got a little over 80 to 100 pictures of arch roofs in Greensboro. This is what you're going to see. The X bracing here is typically put in prior to the decking being put on to support them while they're vertical. The decking supports a lot of these things from that twisting. This is just where I got a lot of my information from. Uh, fire ground size up by Chief Turpak out of New Jersey. If you hadn't read his book, it's pretty good. I got it. More than welcome to it. You don't have to purchase it. Uh, his city is the most populated city in the United States with 60,000 people per square mile. They go to fires. Also, the Art of Reading Buildings by Mettendorf and Dodson. If you want to dive into building construction, it's a good place to start. Very well illustrated, very well written. There's also a show similar to this based off of their book. And you never can go wrong with Brannigan third and fourth edition. <laughs> the picture here is just us. When we got, I got transferred to seven, I went from a 70 foot ladder that you could only do a one trick pony with to a hundred foot that I could reach anything, do anything, set up any way. Always try to shoot for two sides in the roof. I was able to reach this Charlie Delta window back here. Was it tight? Yes. Am I operating under power lines? Yes, but I'm operating under the low voltage. I'm still pretty, pretty well away from them. Turntables parked underneath them. I'm within six to eight foot of them lines. Something that's got to be practiced. It's got to be practiced in a sterile environment prior to doing this at two o'clock in the morning with smoke pouring out of these. These buildings now are now currently gone already. They're on Antis campus. They're getting torn down. Some dormitories going up. Real quick, we'll let it zoom back out. The picture to the left, wood frame, pipe five, balloon frame style construction. Should have done it while it was zoomed out because I don't know if it does it again. Can you back up? There it goes. There any indication about a basement? You know, we talked with these balloon frames that you probably can assume that there's a basement. Grades pretty natural fall from Bravo to Delta throughout both of these homes. I've got some vents down here under the porch. Think basement or not? Not under the porch. I mean, really don't, it's not showing me a basement right now. There was a hand dug basement throughout up to this porch. Now the entrance to that was a crawl space door that was three foot tall. You open that crawl space door, it goes to a set of stairs down into the basement. So that's where we can't just be saying, hey, there's a crawl space door. Uh, no basement or high crawl space to open it up that thing, looking in there and, and getting 100% read on it and getting it back to those interior companies. Get out in your territory. Use the go back for an excuse. These people are more than willing to let you in these buildings. Um, do the check in the boxes get the stuff done, and then just spend a few minutes talking about it. Walk around these buildings 
and go out and do this. We talked to the homeowner prior to this. We got permission, asked if we could do anything for her. This was the fire they had. I was off on Willard and Lacey. Two o'clock in the morning. Probably not going to see that house very well. Don't worry, we put it out for I know, we did. We took a up But, so I wasn't there. We went to look at it before we went and walked through it and looked at what they did. I tried to spot the building. My first time seeing this house. The scenario was there was a police car parked here, which it was there on the vent. Engine uh, 7 was somewhere here. So this is the Alpha side. It's addressed off of Willard. Do you think they used it? No. That would be correct. Heavy hoarder conditions in this house. They used the Charlie side right here as their main entrance. So we was able to catch the roof. Ladder 14 cut two holes in this one and these two windows and also worked this porch roof right here. Talked to the homeowner. At the time of the 911 call, there was five people in this building and one with a handicap. They all got out. One more reason why we've got to be ready. Heavy hoarders conditions in this building. But just go out and practice and play. Spot these rigs if you're driving them. Even the firemen, when y'all get moved up, start playing with them because these things they can do, we got to use them more as just a million dollar Uber. That's a, that's a priceless tool if I've got somebody right here that's heavy, maybe unconscious, or whatnot. That's all I got. Thank you for coming.